Hello and welcome to the Guna Tour back again with you guys for another show for another episode of our Let's Talk Arsenal series. You're joining us on Monday. Uh, it feels it does feel like a Monday. I know who it feels like a Monday for. We're going to get onto that for in a second. Um, but it's been a genuine, uh, really interesting day full of things. It's been rounded off by a bit of news that made me laugh. I mean, you've probably seen a few things creeping around about Wayne Rooney, but when the news breaks that he is a coach has tackled one of his own players and ruled him out for 12 weeks. You know it's been a great day for football. Anyway, we're joined by a couple of great guests today to talk about some interesting stuff regarding Arsenal and specifically why we haven't been able to really move on the players that we've necessarily wanted to so far this season. First off, as I said, it's been a long Monday for some, but I'm not sure many people have had a longer Monday than this man. It's Harry Simeon. How are you doing, mate? Are you well? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Uh, this is rounded off my day in a nice way after a really <laughs> pain in the backside kind of day, but it is what it is. <laughs> How's things with the podcast, Chronicles of Aguna, going well? Yeah, going very well. Going very well. Um, it's been a good month, sort of, in terms of mm. the content. So, yeah, just keeping going like yourself, trying to do things daily at the moment. Grafting. Um, and, yeah, exactly. Grafting, that's the right word. <laughs> mm, 100%. So we're also joined by Sophie from the Highbury Squad. How are you doing, Sophie? You well? <laughs> Yeah, all good. Um, my bad hair day is as bad as Harry's Monday. So, you know, we're all we're trying to just cover it up. And um, this is a great way for me to start my day because it's still only noon here. So great to be on with you guys again, two of my favorites. So thank you for inviting me. So is mine, so Why do you think I'm wearing a hat? <laughs> I was going to say, I find myself on shows with people wearing hats, and I'm not wearing a hat. But I wear a hat quite often. But uh, You're yeah, going to have to I'm get never... some uh, TGT um, TV Merch. stuff going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I had someone message me the other day saying, like, you know the, the, the TGT logo with the cannon in the middle, like the tactics board? People have said, like, could you put that on a hat? And there's just, I don't know what it is. There's just something that's always kind of held me back from, from doing that sort of thing. I just can't, can't bring it. myself to do it. Um, yeah, maybe one day. Uh, anyway, we're obviously here to talk about the Arsenal and specifically kind of a topic that I don't necessarily think has gone under the radar, but it's something that I think obviously with us so focused on the players that we want to bring in and desperately want to see us bring in a midfielder, an attacking midfielder, or a right back, that we're not actually so much focused on the job that Arsenal are doing in regards to sales. And we have seen some players go out. We've seen Mavropanos leave. Sorry, Sophie, do you want to do the honours? Because my Mavropanos... Well, Harry, we, this is finally the way to debate who says it the best, this Harry. Go on. <laughs> and I'll leave it to you, Sophie. Yeah, you know, the there you there go. You Perfect. <laughs> well, he, our Greek defender, has gone out on loan. That um, Greek geezer. <laughs> yes, he's got out on loan to uh, Stuttgart, and we expect that to probably become permanent um, at the end of the season as well. We've obviously seen Saliba leave, and Genduzi's gone as well. But all of them are, are loans, and there may be some fees for Arsenal at the end of the season, but there's nothing in regards to incomings right now. And I mean, on the thumbnail, I put eight players that I kind of don't really expect, or rather shouldn't expect to see still be at the club this summer and we're going to go through quite a few of them and kind of get our ideas about each one but let's talk about things more generally to kick things off Sophie I'll start with you are you what, what kind of area of the spectrum are you on are you concerned panicked or nearing you know some really concerning thoughts about life <laughs> well <laughs> life we can just park that for another conversation for sure but um when you when I saw the title of the show I was like this is a great question because part of Arsenal moving on and turning things around is really getting rid of some of these players who've been there and really not proven themselves or been there for a while, haven't played well, made mistakes along the way that have cost us in certain games. And I thought it was a really interesting conversation to have because we've also been told that we've got to sell before we can buy. And, you know, when you mentioned the loans and everything going on in Europe in terms of trying to remove some of these players, it's indicative of the fiscal financial climate, right? Um, loan deals seem to be the way to go. Just take the players' wages off your bill. Um, you, some clubs, most clubs don't have the money to invest at, at a high level, um, you know, we're even seeing now Manchester City, this story evolving about them and 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 kind of maybe how they fudge numbers. Are they going to be able to buy Harry Kane at 160 million? In this day and age, it just seems like insane. So I also think, though, we do have some players that could be good deals for teams. And as much as we're hustling to bring in players, I think we need to be focused also on hustling to remove some of these players. And how do we do that, right? Maitland-Niles was a play we probably should have shifted last year and didn't. We could have maximized that business opportunity with Wolves. 
Joe Willock should be a player that we shift now. You know, how many more times are we going to kind of hope that he's the guy or he's been given an opportunity? His stock is so high now. His market value is high. If Newcastle want to buy him and we can bring in, what, 20 maybe? I don't know. I'm not an expert. I think he needs to be moved on. Eddie and Ketia, do you go back to the Leeds well? Do you where do you go with him? He's a young talent that maybe Patrick Vieira would want him at, at Crystal Palace. So there's a lot of creative thinking that needs to be done here in terms of how we shift some of these players who've been there for a while. Reese Nelson, what happens with him? What's happening with Lucas Torreira? I mean, he wants to go back to Argentina, but there's no money at Boca Juniors right now to make that happen. So if we're not going to be able to shift some of these players, guys. Are they still going to be a value to the club? Because I I don't see it with most of them. And I just feel like this is a bit of a pickle. It's a growing pickle, not only for us as a team, but a lot of other clubs in the Premier League as well. Harry, I mean, we saw kind of the club in January just chuck players out the club, effectively, just paid players off like Socrates, Mesut Ozil, of course, we ended up still playing his wages until the end of the season, even though he'd permanently gone. Mustafi, Kalasnach went out on loan to try and get some of his wages off the bill. We've still got to try and get rid of him this summer. Do you think it's going to get to a stage kind of in the window where that situation resurfaces once again? Yeah, probably. And I think that was always going to be a realistic outcome. It's not the outcome that we as fans wanted. But I remember doing a podcast right at the start of the summer where I basically ran through the players I expected to leave Arsenal this summer and went through rough amounts of money that I thought we could get for them. And the comments were all people telling me that I'd undervalued so many of them. But the reality is that this is our dead wood. We as a fan base talk about dead wood all the time. That we've almost, I'm not going to blame it on the fans, but we've almost kind of devalued the players ourselves by putting them into that category all the time. The fact that Mikel Arteta uh, has not used some of these players, has put them, pushed them aside, has, has made it abundantly clear that he doesn't feel they're part of the future of the club, has meant that it, we as a club have devalued them. So now we can't expect to get top dollar for them. You look at somebody like Granite Xhaka, you know, who for me, I know a lot of people don't like him, but was one of Arsenal's most important players last season. And we're, we're fighting with Roma to try and get £20 million out of it. You know, then you look at somebody like Hector Bellerin, who most people at the start of the summer would have said, we're going to get £20 million for this guy. And Inter don't want to pay anything for him. So we're in, we're in this place where it's not ideal, it's frustrating. But I think as a club, we're just going to have to accept it and cut our losses. People will say, what can you do more? What can the club do more? Well, if everybody knows that you don't want them and nobody's willing to pay, I'm not sure there is a great deal more that you can do as a football club. You have to make the decision. Do I want this guy at my football club or do I not? And if the answer is I don't, then you've got to do whatever it takes to move them on. And that is going to mean losing some value somewhere. And that is going to mean accepting prices that we probably didn't plan for at the start of the summer. It's just... It's so difficult to get rid of players that you don't want when over the, you know, look at some of them like Bellerin wasn't very good last season. I didn't think, um, you know, you look at some of the others that we tried to move on. Gwenduzi went to her to Berlin. Did he do OK? Did OK, but nothing really more than that. It's not like he went to the Bundesliga and set the place on fire. And now everybody's kind of knocking on the door. So you got to be realistic about about the situation. And I think it's the reality is that we as a football club, in the way we've treated some of these players, in the way we've decided not to use them, in the way the fan base have labelled them, all of those things combined have devalued these players. And for me, it's going to be tough. Tom, can I just jump in? Because I think Harry brings up some really good points. The other, th the juxtaposition to that is, did Chelsea just sold a kid who's hardly kicked the ball in the Premier League? Yeah. You got, Quay, is his name, I think it is. is it he went to, to Palace, yeah. right? Patrick mm. bought him at Palace um, for, was it? 18 million pounds. Okay. So this is the part that I would love to get your, your um, take on, guys, because how are Chelsea able to get 18 million for a player like that who most people don't even know his player characteristics or his mm. attributes? And we have a player like Joe Willock who literally saved Newcastle from relegation last season and was the star in that lineup 
because he that you know he was allowed to play his type of football how how's that possible that's the part that I then find difficult in not saying or pointing the finger at the club and saying how can they do that and we can't do that for me it's it's all about the perception of the club by other clubs that's that's the difference between us and Chelsea is that Chelsea have significantly and consistently sold really, really well. They haven't accepted mm. low fees for players and they've never needed to accept a low fee because they're always, you know, pretty flush for cash and they, they don't necessarily need to bring in money like we do, for instance. But then, the just kind of playing devil's advocate to my own point, you would look at a club like Liverpool and you would say Liverpool are similar to us in the sense that they have a self-sustaining model. They don't have a Russian billionaire behind them like Chelsea do. And they've still sold players like Jordan Ibe, like Dominic Solanke, like Rian Brewster for big fees. And again, yeah. it comes down to the point that they simply have sold well over the years. And that has meant they've not had to have that perception of themselves by other clubs, like where you've seen Arsenal pay off Socrates, pay off Mustafi, pay off Ozil, get really low fees with players like we've seen this year with Genduzi going for basically nothing. And Ketia doesn't look like he's going to get anything despite being a homegrown young striker that's got the record goal score off the under 21s. All of those things I think it's all about the perception about how Arsenal were looked upon by those clubs and that means that say Arsenal send a player on loan like Chelsea did with Gray to Swansea last season at centre-back and did really really well last season mm -hmm. and obviously earned that right to have that figure and you've got a player like Nketia who was sent on loan to Leeds quite rashly without too much thought to whether or not he would with Patrick Bamford still there getting enough minutes he didn't play and so we manage that loan situation quite poorly. And so that in itself also lowers the value and it lowers the number of suitors that are going to be available for him because you've not given him that much of experience. You've got other mm. players in the club that you're just not giving enough game time to, like Reese Nelson, to give them enough value in the market. And clubs aren't just going to pay that amount. because And, then, and the fact of the matter, we come back, and I'm sure Harry will go on to this in a second, but clubs will look at Arsenal and go, they need money. They need to sell players. And... <laughs> we know that we're not going to highball you because you desperately need money and you're going to accept what we're going to want to pay for it. That's exactly it. It's, it's how you package it all up. You know, you could have two of the same product and if one is in is in the right packaging and is marketed properly, it will sell more. Man, uh, the, the big point that you made there is that Chelsea don't need to sell. So when somebody's knocking on the door and saying, we're interested in Mark Gway, for example, Chelsea mm. are not in a place where they have to they're like, well, actually, you know what? We really need this money to build our summer around. They're like, well, we don't need to sell this guy. So make us an offer that is mm. going to tempt us into doing it and make us sell him by tabling an offer that is so good that we have to consider it. And Arsenal simply don't do that because for years and years and years, so many of these players we've looked at and we've gone, not sure they're going to make it. I think we need to move them on. Somebody like Eddie and Ketia is a prime example of that. Tom's absolutely spot on. Went on loan to Leeds. It didn't really work out. Comes back, but then doesn't play enough football. And when he did get chances, he didn't really grab them with both hands. And all the time, that value is decreasing. And I'm scared this is going to happen with Joe Willock because you've mm -hmm. got someone who, as Sophie mentioned, went and done a really good job at Newcastle, probably holds a value now of, for argument's sake, £20 million. But if he has another season at Arsenal where he is on the fringes, is coming off the bench here and there, doesn't really make an impact. And, you know, then 12 months down the line, he's not worth £20 million anymore. He might be worth six, seven million pounds. <laughs> Things can change so quickly in terms of valuations. And, and, and that's my worry with Arsenal. We've never known when the right time is to, to let somebody go. So we all, we're also talking about um, the new way of doing business, right? So our DNA and culture, not only just trying to rebuild on the pitch, but also how we do business, how we set contracts, what we offer players, how we conduct ourselves from that point of view. And all I keep hearing is that, you know, now Raul's gone and all these people are gone the way Adu's doing business. And are people not respecting the fact that we have – is it a, a case of, you know, perception is reality? The stigma is still attached as much as he's kind of, you know, to me, the January transfer window was one of the best in our history because we were able to get rid of the cancer in the dressing room and the click. But at the same time, we did it for free. So are people kind of still taking, are they taking well, the piss, <laughs> right? It, yeah. So even with a do and this new way of doing things, 
we're still kind of touched with that same we we're desperate brush I think there's a lot of kind of from the fan base. I see a lot of finger pointing specifically towards Edu uh, as kind of mm-hmm. someone who's not necessarily doing a good enough job. And I think that there are aspects of his tenure at the club that I do question. Willie Ann signing being a big one, Ronison being another one. Like if you take a recommendation off your a goalkeeping coach about a player, surely you still have to do the research behind it to see if he's genuinely good enough. And I just feel with that signing, they they clearly didn't do enough research because if you speak to any kind of French football expert about how Ronison got on in France, it wasn't particularly like amazing. So. With that, I still think that Edu's done an amazing job regarding kind of contracts. And you look at that side of things and convincing players to sign, along with the likes of Richard Garlick, who's come in previously, and Husfami that was involved before too. Mm-hmm. But you've seen Martinelli, Saka, Smith Rowe, Tierney, all these guys sign new deals. And Balogun, of course, who we all expected to leave, to be honest, at that point. But when it comes to kind of the situation where he's got to sell players in which a lot of the fan base are pointing at him and saying, you're not doing enough work. And, and not just like anyone, but bigger accounts that have kind of a waiting and I know that people don't necessarily like us talking about specific accounts but I mean I saw a tweet from Eduardo Hagen earlier talking about how he feels if he was in charge he wouldn't be sleeping he'd be doing everything he possibly could to kind of get these players out and he would succeed and and I have reservations about if that genuinely takes into context kind of the situation that Edu's found himself in from previous regimes you mentioned Mm -hmm. Raul Sanyehi you we talk about what came before that We've signed players before Edu had genuine control at the club that have, uh, their value has plummeted since. They're either they're not playing and because they were not good enough or they'd never been good enough or they were signed for too much money or we put them on too much money in regards to their new contract renewals, which we often have overpaid. I mean, we had Cole Jenkinson on something ridiculous when we let him go to Nottingham Forest. That's so crazy. all of those things... Edu's now in a situation where he's got to change the perception. That's his, alongside, obviously, the main job of being kind of implementing his style of play with signings alongside Arteta. His other main job, Edu, is to change the perception of how other clubs see us. And I don't think you can do that this summer because there's just too much deadwood at the club. I think we are going to have to cut our losses again. So who are the biggest assets then? Like, who it, who's the golden goose? Like, in, in is it Lacazette? Is it Xhaka? Is it like Bellerin doesn't seem to be like, Mm. you know, where's that big value asset um, that's going to help kind of us from a fiscal point of view, but also in turn get the players, the remaining, what, two or three players at best. Maybe there might be two that are coming in. Maybe it's just one. I mean, building Um, on from that question, mm -hmm. Harry, do you think there's anyone that we're going to sell this summer that's going to get us over 20 million euros? No, <laughs> honestly, no. Um, I don't think there is, and and I think we're we we are kind of guilty as fans of sort of going a little bit OTT in our reaction to some stuff as well. As a general fan base, not not mm. picking on individuals, but as a general fan, <laughs> like base, I did, you mean? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but as as a general fan base, right? You you look at the Gwen Doozy situation, a prime example, right? We bought that guy for, what, seven, eight million pounds, whatever it was. And we've now sold him on. It didn't work out. And we're going to recuperate the money that we got in for him, uh, that we paid for him. But in the eyes of everybody, that's terrible, shocking business. And it's the worst thing we've ever done. We've made our money back on the player. And that's just one example of where, yes, it's not ideal, but we don't really need to be making out that Edu's you know, done a terrible job because of things like that, when ultimately he wasn't even around when we were bringing some of these players in. He's got to flog them and he's got to get what he can get for them. But we also have to be aware of the circumstances that the whole footballing world finds itself in right now. I guarantee you had the pandemic not hit, Roma would not be bartering with Arsenal about two or three million pounds on Granite Xhaka. You know, and it's it's come it's come out this evening, I think, that Serie A are only going to allow their stadiums to have 33% capacity next season, which is another big blow to the pockets of the big clubs like the Romas, uh, the Milans, the Juves, the Inters, etc. So, you know, these these clubs don't have the money. We talk about Bellerin and how we can't get any money out of Inter. And, and the common thing that people were, are saying is, well, they've just sold Hakimi for God knows how much money. So it's Arsenal in the wrong here. It's Arsenal that can't get the money out of Inter. No, Ashraf Hakimi was sold because Inter desperately need that money to balance yeah. their books. It doesn't mean they've now got 20, 25 million pounds to throw at Hector Bellerin. So exactly. 
sometimes you need to think about the, the wider market and not always focus in on Arsenal and look at what's going on around the rest of the continent. So many clubs are doing uh, loans with obligations to buy, loans with options to buy, because ultimately they're cash strapped and they're trying to kick the can down the road so that they can make these payments later down the line. That's what so many clubs are trying to do. And I think that the biggest problem here is that at times we don't look at the wider market and what's going on in the world of football. And we put our Arsenal goggles on and we look at it and we say, well, we can't get the money for Bellerin or we can't get the money for Guendouzi or we can't get it for Xhaka. So it must be Edu's fault. So, so should we be focusing then on more of a UK centric um, business model for this particular window? For example, I know Be- that the, the tough thing is, is the player is going to want to go where they want to go, right? We've even seen with the loan deal with Saliba, he chose to go back to France. And, you know, Bellerin might want to go play in Italy, but fiscally that might not work for Arsenal. So, you know, uh, and I say this, you know, loosely, but newly promoted teams are looking for reinforcements and they've got that money coming up and their TV deal just improved tenfold. I mean, should we be focused more on that? The trouble is, that with some of our players who've played at such a high level before, their perception of themselves may be different to what the market sees them as. Like, is Bellerin really a starting right back for Inter Milan? Maybe he is. But is he more of a starting right back and replaces, you know, Max Ahrens who leaves Norwich and he goes there? I mean, I think one of the things, guys, that we've never done is force sales, force players into boxes to better our business to take Arsenal first. We always have put the player first. We've seen that with letting players go to our competitors over the years. Do we need to be a bit more ruthless? Is it even possible to do that in today's football world? I I don't know. I don't know that it is because what you do essentially as a football club is you accept the bid from the other football club that wants to sign your player. And then it's over to the club and the player to agree terms to ultimately complete a deal. So you could accept as many offers as you want for Hector Bellerin, but if Hector Bellerin doesn't want to go to Norwich, for example, just to use that example, Mm -hmm. then he's not going and the deal doesn't get completed. So players have the power nowadays to make it really, really difficult for you to ship them off to teams that they don't necessarily want to join. And that is that is the, one of the big issues, isn't it? You can't just push someone into going somewhere. They have to want to do it. And, Somebody like Hector Bellerin, who's spent all these years at Arsenal, I don't think he'd be open to joining a club like that. And with all due respect to Norwich, he feels that he can play for an Inter or, uh, you know, somebody in Spain of a kind of higher level. And, And that's the big problem, isn't it? You have to have all of the ingredients together. You need a club that they want to join, a club that's willing to pay for them. And you need that club to offer you a fee that you feel is is, is relative to what they're worth. And it's so difficult sometimes to find all of those things and for all of that to click into place. It's like people sometimes probably look at it and I don't know, maybe do they play too much FIFA? I don't know. And they just feel like (laughs) it's genuine that easy. It is a genuine problem because... Um, well, we laugh about the idea of kind of social media and video games and football manager and FIFA, but it does genuinely have an impact on kind of yeah. the moldable, malleable minds of of our youth. Uh, and I mean that as, as least condescendingly as, as feasibly possible. Um, but genuinely, like for me, uh, I used to use FIFA as a tool. I mean, I know a lot more about football from actually just playing FIFA from the clubs to countries to flags, like just knowing more about the world in, and football in particular. But now I, I, and I don't play it because because I just think it's a ridiculous game. Um, but beyond that, I think that when you look at kind of the how easy it is to go on to, say, a career mode and to buy a player, and, and now the fact that they have implemented kind of like the the uh, the visual simulation of you going into a negotiation <laughs> as well, and Petr Cech's wearing his, his, his cap still on his head so when you go into those. It's hilarious if you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> but that makes people think that that's how it works. It's just not like that. And it, I know that a lot of people are not that, say, open-minded in the sense of believing it's it's similar to that. But unfortunately, 
there is a case in point where you see, say, the obvious tweet I'm thinking about is where you see someone list all the possible outs with a load of figures next to them and all the possible ins with another load of figures. And we've still made a profit of £75 million. How have we done this? <laughs> like, and that's what you see. And, and it's just not that easy because when it comes down to kind of like a value of a player, which is something we can talk about, there are so many factors that come into play in terms of length of contract, in terms of nationality, in terms of age, in terms of output, in terms of injury records. I mean, and that's just a small number of those factors. So when we say, look at, so let's let's take Sophie Torreira, for instance, mm -hmm. who's not only the fact that he's not homegrown, that he's got a few, a couple of years left on his current deal, that he's vocally come out and said that he wants to leave and named a specific club as well, which is a, a big stab in the heart to Arsenal's possible action of trying to get more money for him. Mm -hmm. but, and has recently kind of not, completely done our 180 but he has been more kind of open to the idea of moving to say italy and lazio and somewhere else or even he said he's, he's currently an arsenal player or whatever and he kind of did i think a little bit more level-headed after the emotional roller coaster he's been on do you think there is any hope in this market still post pandemic still during the pandemic that we can get and you can use to or any other player that we can genuinely get say any good percentage of what we paid for lucas Torreira back it's a really good question. Firstly, I'd like to say I'm a FIFA virgin. I have no idea about that game. I mean, I'm sure you boys are experts on it, but no. Um, I you was know. before I had a kid, and now I'm not allowed to play. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that plays into this as well when players are thinking about moving Tom and Harry is their own brand, right? Where does it fit for me to be next? How does that move my mission forward? How does that move my own brand forward? And Torreira to me doesn't strike me as that kind of player, whereas Bellerin does. And that's not because I'm criticizing Bellerin. Bellerin is just much more of a, he's worldly in the sense that he's involved in a lot of, you know, sustainable projects and he's involved in a lot of human rights stuff. And, you know, I think he needs a platform where he's going to have a voice that is is heard. Whereas Torreira to me just seems like a, an old fashioned footballer that wants to play football, but he's got to be happy where he's playing it. And if that means him being able to go back to Italy somehow, I think people would be happy to see Torreira find a spot to, to be able to do that. But also, is Torreira the kind of player that can be turned? And this is what I haven't seen Arteta be able to do. A lot of the players that we want to get rid of or have expressed a displeasure, at, you know, or an unhappiness, right? We've not been able to turn them. And I, I don't want to give Salibur as the example because there's a million and one things that have happened in that whole narrative. You know, losing parents, you know, being unhappy, being young, being in a foreign country. I know it's people just think France to England, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal, guys, when you move country. I moved country and I was able to speak the same language. You move country and you, if you, if it's foreign to you wherever you go, right? But one of the things I've wanted to see a little bit more of Edu and Arteta is if the player is talented and he can still bring value to the team, can you convince him to stay? If it doesn't make sense for us to be able to sell him on and get the ROI that we need. I'm not sure if Torreira's that that player, but he seems to me to maybe be one of the ones that could be convinced to, convinced to do that. And then maybe, I don't know what his contract is. How long does he have left on his contract? Do you guys know? Bellerin or Xhaka? Uh, Torreira. Um, Torreira, yeah. Um, My head was there. I was reading the if, chat box thinking about that. <laughs> if he's if if he's able to be convinced to stay, you know why why not? Torreira hasn't just become a bad player overnight. It's just life circumstances that have seen us and mm. seen him regress. And I would just like to see Adu and Arteta do a little bit more of that. So when you put your your question up, I'm like. Who can they convince to stay that would still bring value to the team? And we haven't seen that type of man management from Arteta yet. It's Gwenduzi's a shithead. Get rid of him. You know, X isn't good enough. Get rid of him. Get rid of get, get. But who can you really put your arms around and say, you know what, Torreira, I think you can still bring value to our midfield. I, I, yeah. The only I, thing I'd say about that, though, is and, and I get that and I, I think it makes it makes good sense. And, and if I was the manager, I'd probably be looking to do that. But I think Arteta's in this place where he's looking at what we've got. He's looking at some of these players and he's simply thinking to himself, I don't have time to 
spend time trying to convince these guys to stay at Arsenal Football Club. And if they don't want to be there and their heart's not in it and they're, they're not passionate about the project, then I don't think they should be around the club. And in one sense, that's seen positives because it's seen us move on some players, that, some of those players that we moved on last January who were supposedly bad for the dressing room and, and obviously were not part of the future, the Mustafis, the Ozils, et cetera, et cetera. But then the re reverse side is that is that so that you do there will be some players that maybe could offer value, but is Arteta willing to invest the time and the effort to try and persuade them? And I think in his mind, if they're not persuaded already and they are not sort of on board themselves, then they're not worth his time. And I'm not saying that's right. I just think that's the way he looks at it. Mm. Maybe it is right though. Like maybe maybe that is the right way to, to to look at it. I think, and I think that we've heard things kind of about the way in which they're approaching the transfer market this year is that if a player doesn't isn't a hundred percent on coming to Arsenal, that they're they're just ruling it out. Which is why I find it strange how we're kind of persisting with this Locatelli thing if we're if we are led to believe those rumours. But it's 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 a difficult one, isn't it? Because I think when you said earlier, Sophie, that has Arteta yet kind of turns the opinions. We were led to believe he changed the mind of Granite Xhaka from leaving previously, and mm -hmm. that maybe it can because he was going to be hurt at Berlin. I think at the time with a club that are really interested, and he, he convinced him to say stay during that period after the whole Crystal Palace episode. That, but that's that is about it. That's that's the only really one that I can but, think. But of then it's holding it. on too long to Maitland Niles. Should let him go, right? Are we yeah. holding on? too long to Willock so there's this mm. there's this kind of you know turnkey feeling about maybe it's a disconnect you know why are we trying to hold on to certain players and not others and then letting some go and it all makes sense and it will all wash out in the end but why hold on to Maitland Nars when we could have made money off him why are we trying to hold on to Joe Willock right now I, I don't understand that I mean he's had his opportunities in the first team and if people think that's going to change, it's not. We're going to see the same thing. And then people just start yelling in a few months' time saying, oh, we should have sold him when we had the chance. Certain players that come out of Hayland End aren't all ESRs and Sackers. And it's okay to let it go. And I think sometimes we're attached to players emotionally. Um, and sometimes I just think we need to be a bit more ruthless. And there's the odd play like Torreira where I'm like, is, our, is he... Re is he going to be a player that can still bring value? And I understand what people are saying, that he might not be happy and he doesn't want to play at the Arsenal. But if you can't sell him, for, because I think he has value, you know, and the problem is he wants to go back to Argentina, but also over a period of time, you know, dealing with grief, it, you, you have a bit more openness. In the immediate grief, you just want to be home. You want to be surrounded by your family, your friends. But as life moves on, you know, you're able to move on and maybe see things a little bit differently. And I just don't know if that's the case with him. Just going back to the Ainsley Maitland-Niles one, though, mm -hmm. would would you guys have sold him at that point for £15 million? Pounds? Because remember, he, he'd done really well in that FA Cup run, didn't he? I, Playing in that wing-back area. And and he, I, I thought he looked really good. And I was looking at him at that point thinking, well, Ainsley Maitland-Niles is a valuable asset to this squad. And I personally, if I had set my price tag at a certain amount and it wasn't met, then I wouldn't have sold him either. I think it's. I think that a lot of people look back on it and say, yeah, because he didn't play much and because of what happened in the second half of the season where he was loaned out, he should have been sold. But at the time, I didn't feel it was the right thing. So I'm not going to beat Arteta up too much about that one because I would have done the same, I reckon. I, the thing about Maitland-Niles is that obviously – he was playing as kind of that left wing back in a system that I never mm. really foresaw Arsenal sticking with. And he kind of excelled in a, in a, in a wing back role rather than the, the single full back role, which I don't necessarily think he has excelled in. I still see some opinions circulate that they feel he could be our best right back, but I'm not sure that he can be our best right back in a back four. I think he works when you've got three centre backs behind him because he can kind of push up and it's not so bad if he gets caught out of position. But for me, when that happened and the, the Wolves bid that came in, which I think was between 15 and 18, I think you mentioned it, was a bid at the time, which I think is is one that you learn from. And then you you look at the Joe Willock situation and you say, if we get a £20 million bid for him, which I, I look back now and go, 
I was crazy to think we could get 30 mil in this kind of situation because I think 30 mil is way too high, for, especially for the clubs that are interested in and their budgets and what they're able to do. But mm. 20 million for a player that's had a good six months uh, and prior to that has really struggled in the Premier League is a pretty good return. I don't think anyone thought, say, back in October of last, last year, we would have been getting 20 million kind of a, as a figure for Joe Willock right now. But then, Sophie, what you were like, kind of touching on was the, the idea about it's okay to kind of let some players go and, and some people struggle with that idea. And I think one of the reasons for that is this idea of the PTSD of the Serge Gnabry's, the Ismail Banassas of this world. 100%. And because we've seen those guys go on and flourish, John Yo Marlin just moved to Borussia Dortmund for 25 million quid. Like we've seen these guys flourish elsewhere. There's always going to be that part of you that goes, well, Christ, what if Ainsley McManus goes off and excels elsewhere? What are we going to do? Like Amy Martinez is another big one, of course, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I always, I always saw, um, a, a, you know, Ainsley as a, f and I say this with respect, a Phil Neville at Man United. You know why? Because we kind of put him in that hole. Mm. But I think he was starting to become the jack of all trades and master of none in his mind because he's always wanted to play midfield, whereas. If we are honest, some of the best of Pepe when everyone thought Pepe was having a terrible season was when Niles was on playing right back and Pepe was in front of him. And we saw Pepe regress in his position maybe a little bit when Bellerin was playing behind him because Bellerin just didn't have that you know, defensive discipline the same way Niles did. But when you have a player who wants to play a certain position and he becomes unhappy, I guess I'm kind of reverting back to my Torreira thing. I, I would love them to stay, but... You, you can't put square pegs in round holes as much as I would like that. So I do believe he was this hybrid player that every team needs. He could play right back. He could play midfield. He could be squished and squashed into lots of different positions. But clearly choosing West Brom was also a bad decision for him because it was a terrible loan spell. He did it because he wanted to play midfield and it didn't work out, right? And, um, and I think that now it's the time for him – to move, I just think we need to move on. If Arteta wants to create success, he's got to build a team in his image. And I say this over and over again, the best managers do that. You know, his personality, his characteristics, it's on the pitch. We see it. We see it with Klopp, Pep, Conte. Um, we see it with Tuchel. You know, we see it with um, Simeone. Uh, we see it with all of these managers. And until Arteta has his players, we're never going to see that Arsenal and that's why I think we need to be a bit ruthless and move the Willocks and the Maitland Nileses on, um, and maybe even the Torreira that I mentioned on as much as we can. We know we're going to lose our asses money wise. It's just going to happen. It's just the time that we're living in. So, how best can you combat that um, so you don't lose your ass completely? Yeah. Harry, do you want to tackle that? Uh, yeah, I, I think. <laughs> It's a tough one, isn't it? It's so hard because hindsight is a wonderful thing and you can look back on some of the decisions and say, we should have done this or we should have done that. I'm I'm a big sort of believer in that you shouldn't get drawn into this kind of emotional thing where it's an academy graduate and so you have to keep him. If he doesn't fit in the team and he's not right, you know, then you move him on. And gone are the days of, you know, Manchester United in the early 90s when they brought through homegrown players and they went on and won. God knows how many trophies off the back of that. I just think times have changed. And I think the ruthlessness is important now um, more than ever, especially when we're going for a rebuild. I think that hesitation sometimes around certain players where we've not really made the decision and we've let it sort of roll on a little bit longer has proven to cost us at times. It's a, it's a really tough one to know when the right time is to let players go and when it isn't. That's one of the arts of management, I guess. And, I think if we thought that Mikel Arteta wasn't going to make some mistakes uh, as, you know, a brand new manager coming into a really big club, I think that would have been a little bit naive. So mm. I, I'm I'm still willing to give him the benefit of the doubt on, on some of those things. But, you know, equally, we look at some of that squad and we've been talking about it for so long as needing to be ripped out and rebuilt from scratch. And now we can't have a go at Mikel Arteta for not keeping hold of certain players because we may be overpaid for them prior to his arrival, or maybe in Arsene Wenger's case, we overinvested too much time in some of these people, the likes of Maitland Niles, who's had loads of time, that's been given loads of opportunities, maybe hasn't in some people's books ticked all the boxes. 
Arteta shouldn't be held accountable for that. And if he thinks he's, that he's not right or anybody else, then as the manager, he's got the right to make the call and make the decision. And and that's where that's where I am on it, really. I'm not, I don't get too emotionally attached to players. And I don't really, you know, when someone like Saka and Smith Rowe come through, they're Arsenal lads. And obviously that's great to see. And you do feel a little bit of something special with them. But that's because they're super talented as well. For me, it's not because they're from Hale End. I felt the same way with Cesc Fabregas. He wasn't from Hale End. So you've got to you've got to put that aside and just look at talent. Are they good enough? Can they impact the team? Can they take you forward? If not, make the decision and get rid. I, I am definitely overly emotionally invested in both Saka and Smith Rowe at this point. Like, if, <laughs> if, if they were to go, it would be like the fiance upping and going <clears> off <throat> with Mike from the Gunners pod at this point. It really oh, genuinely God. would be. Imagine that. There's a picture. Uh, it's they're, they're... <laughs> incoming meme from Magic Mike. That's for oh, sure. He, right he sent me a video the other day, and this, this is this is PG enough for me to share this. But uh, he was doing obviously his road trip, I think, across the states to get to Florida. And obviously there is a Florida, uh, there is, sorry, there's a state called Georgia, which happens to be the same name as my, my other half. And he sent me a video of him driving into Georgia and saying, I have now entered Georgia. So uh, that was fantastic to, <laughs> to get a video from him saying great oh, stuff. He's, he's a great oh, friend, isn't he? He's wonderful. Anyway, we move on to your questions in the chat box for the last 20 minutes or so. Feel free to throw as many in as you like, and we'll try and tackle as many as we feasibly can. Um, Matt Thornton, Sophie says, do you feel we could fall into a trap where the players wait to be paid off rather than going for a fee? I would say simply to that in a nutshell, yes, because we've seen it before. And I think that in today's day and age, as even we who've struggled with COVID and jobs and you want to take care of your family, you want to make sure you got back up, you know, you need to pay the mortgage, the light bill, all of these things, everyone lives to a standard of their income. Everyone lives to a standard that they've set. And I, I do think that, that especially some players who may be in the twilight of their careers might be thinking that, but I just, I also think that this is where the club need to be, need to be ruthless. But at the same time, when we are, we're losing hand money, hand over fist. That's the problem. It's, it's not the result or the responsibility of this current regime. Unfortunately, they've inherited this and they're trying to deal with it. And there's going to be some pain uh, and it's going to be a lot of money down the drain, unfortunately. Wenger did predict this as well, didn't he? Got to yeah. say. Um, yeah. And I, I have paid my lights bill, by the way. I just... <laughs> <laughs> you've been having a light show with the way the camera is trying to focus on the different bits of light uh, you know what it is it's the daylight coming in it's the, uh, <laughs> yeah. apologies if you are not okay with flashing lights we do apologize um harry if it was up to you who would arsenal's new number eight be is that in terms of who would i bring the part in? a partner i think or, yeah is who yeah. would you who would you bring in yeah Oh, if I could pick anybody, I'd probably, of all the people that we've been linked with, I'd like mm. to see Locatelli come in, but I don't think that that's feasible, if I'm honest. Um, yeah, I agree. I think that he is headed for Juve one way or another. But other than outside of him, I think from the players that we've been linked with, I think that for me, I'd probably look at Ruben Neves. I mean, I know a lot of people are a little bit divided on him and, and wonder whether he is necessarily the the right answer. But I think he's got a lot of the the attributes that that kind of player needs. I think he he can get forward um, in a little bit more of an advanced role. I think in Nuno Santos' side, he was quite restricted, as were all the Wolves players, because it was mm. so rigid the way they played. Can't wait to watch Spurs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, if they were moaning about Mourinho, they're going to be oh. moaning about Nuno, aren't they? So, yeah, I, I like him. He's, he's great at set pieces. He's very tactically aware which is something that people don't often say about him. He does fill the right positions from a defensive standpoint. And that side of his game is on point uh, as well as what he brings to the table technically. So I, I think he would be the answer for me. Look, unless you're going to go and spend 60, 70 million pounds, which I don't think Arsenal are. And I think in, in the sort of 30 to 35 million pound bracket, I think that's a pretty good option. And, I, and I'd probably explore that. Uh, Tayo says, Tom, do you think that Arsenal, uh, the squad and the team next season can go on a long winning run? Consistency is key. The obvious answer to me is, is no. Um, one of the reasons for that is because obviously we're not in Europe anymore. So we are just playing these Premier League fixtures at the weekend. And the thing about Premier League fixtures is you play three and you've got a Man City. You play another three and you've got another Chelsea or you might have a Chelsea and a City back to back. There's so many tough games 
in the Premier League now. Like you, you look, you go down the table, and there's barely an easy game. If and I mean, there isn't an easy game for Arsenal these days. So, no is the obvious answer. <laughs> um, but I hope that we can. Is is it would be the answer to that? Uh, Matt G. Sophie says we've spoken a lot about the fans' expectations, but what do you think are the Cronkies' expectations next season? Do they have expectations? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I would think that our goal would be to get back into Europe, however we can, whether that's going to be the Europa League or the Champions League. Um, I think that would be an expectation. I think maybe Adu and Arteta have bigger expectations than the owners in terms of you know being ex-players. They have a huge responsibility this season. Um, first 10 games are going to be critical for Arteta. For Arteta. We have mm -hmm. to get off to a really good start. Can you imagine the negativity if we really get off to a bad start? We've got some tough games um, in August and early September. So I've got my fingers crossed as much as I've been critical of Arteta. There's nothing more I would love than to see him succeed because that means the Arsenal succeed. Um, so the owners, I don't, I, don't, I don't take them into account really in terms of expectations. Um, I put that on Arteta and Adu to, to kind of make that happen based on their character and their, their personality. But I think most of us, you know, would be stoked if somehow we stole a European place in the Premier League next season. I just want to see us be competitive. Mm. That would be a start. I'd, I'd love to get to the kind of final game of the season where we're still in able it. to get top four. Like that, yeah. that's for me is, and I mean, for some people, that's still not enough. And like it's, it's unrealistic, I think, to think of anything more than top four. As, and I think to get top four, as I said, I think on with both of you guys on the show, that top four is an unbelievably good season. Top six is a good season. And, and below that, you'd say, is not what we haven't achieved our target. But top, top four, four is, would leave people shook, wouldn't it? Yeah. Really. If we were able to steal one of those spots, everyone yeah. would be like, I didn't see that coming. No. Even without European football this year, I think top four is just still an unbelievably good achievement yeah. if, if Arsenal were to do it, considering the competition for that. Uh, Harry, Naveen says, what are the three core positions that must be filled and higher from Trinidad? Hello, Naveen. But uh, what do you think, Harry? Uh, the, the biggest priorities for me are the centre of midfield to so that player we were talking about alongside Partey. I like the look of Lakonga, but this is somebody who's been bought with a view to the future. And so I think we need to bring in another midfield player. That's my number one. Number two, I'm going to go with the goalkeeping position, even if it's just a, a second choice for to backfill Burn Leno in the event he's unavailable because we're desperately short there. Brunerson is just not good enough. Looks like he's going to be going out on loan anyway. And then you've got Okonkwo, who looks like a great prospect, but I think based on the preseason. I know you shouldn't read into preseason too much. just doesn't look ready um, for that level yet. So that goalkeeper is number two. And, and then I think I'd rather see us bring in an attacking midfield player than a right back. I know a lot of people are talking about right back, but I think just kind of, I've been thinking about it over the last few days, been doing some work on it. And when you think that we've got Cedric, we've got Chambers, Ben White could probably fill in there if you needed him to. Ainsley Mate and Niles is still at the club as of now. I think the attacking midfield position to take some of that creative burden away from Smith Rowe or the Smith, as they like to call him, is yeah. uh, is important. <laughs> don't, you don't like the Smith? Don't, please don't make that trend. I don't like it either. I do not like that at <laughs> Why all. Why don't That's, you like the Smith? That I'm... is such a marketing, like, desperation <laughs> move, if ever I've seen one. Oh, my gosh. Please stop the madness. You think they sat Nuno Tavaj down and said, you need to call him the Smith? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know, but I don't like it. You know, <laughs> oh, with a no. twist to the question, what if Lakonga is the guy? Why is right. everyone assuming <laughs> that he's the future? Why he, can't he play now? It's, 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 I always compare it to the signing of Matteo Guendouzi. It's one of those signings where you've signed him with a view to the future, but if he's good enough and he's showing it and he's fighting for a place in the team, then you pick him and you play him. And mm. I've got no objection to that. But he still has to earn it for me. And I think to go into a season, with because I think El Nenny, as, as much as he works hard, I think that's a massive drop off in quality when you start going there. You've got Torreira, who might not be at the club as well. I think it would be incredibly naive of Mikel Arteta to go into the new season without another ready-made centre midfielder to partner Thomas Partey. It's been an area of our team that has been really problematic over the last few years. And he's corrected half of it by bringing Thomas Partey in. 
And this summer should be the summer where he corrects the rest of it. Because if you're going to let Granit Xhaka go as well, and you don't you don't bring someone in, I would argue our midfield's weaker and it's a step backwards. So for I me, agree that's we need important. the depth. I agree we need the depth. And there's no what I mean, he could sign another 20 year old that is less experienced than Laconga. He's an Andalet captain. He played under Vincent Company. I'm just saying, like, is there a possibility that someone might not come in? He looks to El Neni, he's got Laconga, he's got party. I'm not sure Aziz is going to get, you know, chances this season, but um it just seems like we're expecting this signing to happen. And but remember it, as well, we, we've got the African Cup of Nations. Mm -hmm. That means El Neni and Partey are likely to be gone as well. Yeah, and Pepe. Yeah, I mean, Aubameyang, you could put Lacazette up front. Pepe, you could, we've got players that, but sure. in the centre of midfield, if El Neni and Partey are gone and you don't bring in someone else, then I think you leave yourself incredibly short again. So that yeah. for me, of all the positions that Arsenal need to address, that for me is the most important. And I'd be breaking the bank to do that before I do anything else. Yeah. I, so I, ag cool. I agree with you, but I've seen this, we've seen this rodeo before, right? Where yeah. <laughs> it might just be it, you know, barring maybe Ben White coming in. I mean, I'm not saying, I hope not, but it's possible. Of course. And that and that will be a big kick into the teeth of, of a lot of fans who have kind of said and held their hands up and been like, whilst it wasn't the best year last year, look, he's not going anywhere, Arteta. And, and he, along with Edu, have got had this plan. They've talked about publicly about this plan that they've wanted to enact this summer. And if they don't get in those key positions in a season that's a real opportunity for Arsenal without European football, it will come down exceptionally hard on them. And uh, it, it, already we know how bad it can get, uh, kind of in the negative sense of the Arsenal fan base and the pressure that they can apply. But with fans back in grounds, if results aren't going the right way because we haven't got the quality and we didn't add the quality, the same way we didn't add a number 10 during the, the end of last summer when we desperately needed mm -hmm. one and we saw what happened in the first six months without that creativity, then it's going to be a very toxic place to be. And I don't use that word lightly. And Tom and Harry, do you, if if Roma don't stump up the three million more, we've seen deals fall through before. Mm. Is it possible that we would say no? You know, three million is like 10 million in today's market. So there's that to consider too. Like the Xhaka deal could fall through potentially. I, I, I mean, think, I don't know. I think as the window goes on, somebody will will buckle on that because the player is pushing for it now as well. Mm. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to end up with a player that doesn't want to be at a club, and can you just imagine the uproar from the Arsenal fan base if we didn't move Granite Xhaka on and then he played and he made a mistake? I mean, yeah. Mikel Arteta would be essentially digging his own grave, waiting for the fans to literally tear him a new one off the back of mm. uh, that kind of decision. So I do think this is one of those deals, and it's a bit like a couple of other deals. I think the Odegaard thing is going to go this way as well. Arsenal clearly won him, but this is one of those things that's going to go right down to the wire because no nobody wants to give in. Once mm -hmm. you're up against the constraints of time, which we aren't at the moment, really, there's still over a month to go in the window, then people start to get into gear, and, and I'd expect somebody to to make some kind of compromise somewhere but you're right you know it could collapse but if it did i just think it, i just think it's too far down the line there's been too much talk of him going and and mm. given the player we're talking about and all of his previous it would be seen as a disaster now if that don't go through there's a few people in the chat yes. saying they wouldn't mind if Xhaka stayed. Um, I wouldn't. Whilst I've, I, the thing is, I, I you know, you guys know that I've obviously really kind of supported the idea of Granite Xhaka and, and really kind of pushed and respected what he brings to the team. But the problem is, is Granite Xhaka that has pushed to move away and that's got his mind in other places. I'm just, I just can't see that working out positively uh and and that's the issue and so it's as we've talked about before and i've talked about on both of your channels is is i feel we don't need to bring just one center midfielder in that we need two we need to add two central midfielders into this team i mean the, the african cup of nations you brought up harry is a really important factor but even into the long term there is just simply not enough quality in an area that we have struggled with quality for such a long time which used to never be a problem for us but it genuinely is now and we aren't addressing it as stringently as we desperately desperately need to uh, as we kind of round down to the kind of last few minutes of the show thank you so much by the way everyone that's been tuning in and watching please make sure you drop a like on the video and make sure you go follow these guys channels because they're absolutely fantastic um we i kind of want to touch upon the idea of not worst case scenario but like what your biggest fear is towards the end of this window i know it's very easy to say that we don't sign anyone else 
But it could be towards a genuine signing that we might make. It might be a mistake that we make. It might be spending too much on a certain player. Sophie, I'm going to kick off with you. What's your biggest fear going into the end of this window? Um, my biggest fear is that we're irresponsible with certain potential transfers like spending $30 million on a goalkeeper like Ramsdale. Mm. That, to me, seems like... We, I think we could do better. I think we could find better. And I think maybe that's the type of position where we could get a loan in because that kind of money, I'll give it to Harry and you to spend in that midfield. Um, and I, I don't want us to be, to be in a position where we, we end up being a thin squad again. And then you find all of a sudden that, you know, you haven't planned properly. You've got these plays that you've been wanting to go for a while, but then there's not the same coming in. So I just hope that we do the right thing. We don't sell our souls. Um, and, you know, that Mikel Arteta really has the team that he wants. If he doesn't have the team that he wants, there's just going to be a bunch of excuses again. So, you know, I hate transfer window time and I love it all at the same time because it divides people and it unites people. And all it takes is, you know, a couple of really good signings and, and we're off to the races. So my hope is that we do the right thing and we spend the money in the right places. Sorry, I was just replying to Harry. There, we just sort out a little bit of feedback from him. That's fine. Um, in regards to kind of then, Harry, your biggest fear end of this window, where's your head at? Um, my biggest fear is that we we don't address the midfield uh, properly, sufficiently, if you like, with a player that can come in and improve us. There's been a lot of discussion about you know who we should get, and we've been linked with a number of players. But for me. It's really important that, yes, in the eyes of some, they're going to have a party because Granit Xhaka may well move on. But that means nothing if you don't improve on him. And that's the biggest thing for me. My biggest fear is that we end up with a midfield that is without a player that has obviously divided everybody's opinion and a player who has a lot of sort of haters. But the fear is that we don't actually improve it enough to actually take the team onto another level because I think that we desperately need to do that. I think the defence was OK uh, last season in comparison to how it has been. I think a lot of the lack of creativity, though, came from the midfield, and it's important that we address that area. So my biggest fear is we don't do it well enough. I think for me, the biggest one is, is again, the overspending. I lean more towards as, as a big fear, um, especially on certain players. Sophie, you hit, the, you hit the nail on the head in regards to Ramsdale. Like, that's just crazy. Like, I just can't wrap my head around... A thirty million pound, what would essentially be a backup right now? I mean, it's twenty six million pound, really, but it's still a crazy amount of money. And then the other one is Tammy Abraham, who I kind of get, like, as an I get as a concept why we're interested in him being homegrown, twenty three, Premier League proven, fifteen goals in in nineteen twenty specifically, but forty million pounds on a striker when, as Harry's brought up, we desperately need to address the midfield again. Just seems misplaced in terms of judgment but there's a lot that can go wrong but fingers crossed it's it falls in the other end of the spectrum when we reconvene i'm sure we will towards the end of the window as well it's been an absolute pleasure uh, this evening to be joined by two fantastic members of the arsenal youtubing sphere that we like to call our home firstly sophie thank you ever so much for your time really appreciate it i know the listeners have been singing your praises in the chat box so thank you ever so much for tuning in thanks for having me i appreciate it Thank Do you. you. Want to give yourself a plug. Yeah, at Highbury Squad, we're going live in two minutes uh, over on our channel. So swing by if you haven't had enough Arsenal talk for one night. Um, come and uh, come and hang out with us for a little bit. We're going to highlight the US Gooners, who God bless them, are still in Orlando. Still went to Orlando, even though the Florida tour was cancelled. So I want to be sure that they get a little bit of a shout out tonight. Yeah, Mike's been putting up some really good videos over on the uh, Gunas Pod Twitter. Make sure you do check them out, especially when he tries to ploy an Everton fan to say that Kevin Campbell's the best player He's ever. He's been just and they don't. me all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Uh, Harry, absolute pleasure as always, mate. Uh, tell people where they can find you and what you're going to be up to. Yeah, thank you for having me. Really, really appreciate it. Always great to chat to you guys. Uh, you can find me on the Chronicles of Aguna. You can find me on 90min.com and uh, wherever else. Uh, but yeah, check out the Chronicles of Agoon. That's the main the main place. And of course, on Twitter, at Harry Simu. 
Awesome stuff. You can find us at Laguna Talk TV if you didn't know already. And of course, you can find myself at Tom Canton Media too. Please make sure you drop a like on the video and subscribe if you are new as well. And if you'd like to vote for any of us three in the Football Content Awards, I've seen plenty of votes for all three of us. So please make sure you do. The information is on the Football Content Awards website. And I'm sure you'll find info on our Twitter feeds as well. I'll see you guys very, very soon. And as always, up the Arsenal. Mm-hmm.